a lot of our winners, uh, you know, the people who are making consistent profit um, have found those issues. Full disclosure, we operate our own market maker that trades on these markets, you know, like we don't hide that at all. Now going on to the commission, there is not one size fits all commission. Okay, so thanks for coming on with us the, this morning here, Jason. Um, I really appreciate it, as I think people watching the YouTube channel will too. Just to get a little bit of an alternative view on you know, how your operations managed and, and why various things are in place. I've got a couple of questions I want to pick your brains with myself. Uh, I've picked a couple out from sort of like the online community that have asked various things too. Um, a lot of them are actually directed as complaints at Betfair. Obviously, I think that they've kind of neglected customers a little bit recently. Um, so it'd be interesting to get your take on that. But before we get into the questions, if you just want to kind of give us a little bit of insight from the inside, how you started markets, why it was, um, and yeah, just take from there. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on. I, I really like your channel. And, uh, you know, your, the video that you did on Football Index, I found it the most cogent explanation ever on, uh, on how that works. So I really like what you're doing for the community. Um, the reason I started this business, I, I was first a stock trader. And when I was a stock trader, I saw a website that would let people trade the presidential election. And I thought, holy cow, this is incredible that you can trade something that you can watch on TV. I was and, and still am a political junkie. And I, I thought it was such an amazing concept that you could trade in events. And then I saw that Betfair is doing the same thing for sports. And I thought, again, that's amazing that you can trade the outcome of sports. But even with my, you know, my professional trader hat on, I studied computer science at university. I saw that the pricing, of the way Betfair was doing pricing on sports was just insane. Like the margin was insane. And I thought that there's got to be a better way to do it. So the reason why I like to tell that story is because that, you know, I founded the company 13 years ago now, and it's always been our North Star is basically trying to bring financial technology to sports betting. The main benefit of that is price. Uh, the, the margin that people pay in sports betting is insane, insane, insane compared to the financial industry. And that's the main thing that we're trying to do. And there's also other things that we're trying to do in fixed betting. You know, there's a whole bunch of, nasty business practices, which I'm sure your customers are very, very familiar with, um, that we're trying to help clean up. But the main thing that we're trying to do to fix betting is is uh, change the pricing models. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think that sometimes people don't understand the alternative side to that with, with some of the bookmakers' operations too. Uh, maybe we'll touch on that in a second. Um, yeah. But there, there is some slightly uh, questionable stuff that goes on, without a doubt. Um, so yeah. for, compared to when you started until now, has kind of like the marketplace evolved as you expected? Because from my perspective, as, a, as somebody who's interested in Betfair, not from the start, but kind of like a little bit earlier on, I find it a bit frustrating that exchanges haven't grown um, further. Yeah, I think I share that sentiment. Um, you know, back when I started, I thought that, you know, the, the superior mechanics of an exchange would, would kick the butt out of the sports book. But, I but from, my, from where I'm sitting, my perspective is that the main reason exchanges has, haven't caught on is because of the interface. Um, you know, I'll hold our hand up and say that, you know, our interface is very similar to Betfair because we wanted to capture Betfair's market share and bring them over to us. But I think that if you show a, a classic exchange interface to somebody that doesn't know anything about sports betting, they won't be able to figure out it out. And I think really good interfaces, no matter what industry you're in, somebody uh, should be able to look at it and figure it out. And so, you know, we have different ideas for how to make that better. But I think that's one of the main reasons that, uh, you know, your everyday punter hasn't switched from your high street bookie to, to the exchange. One of the hypotheses that, hypotheses that we have, if you, if you believe that logic, that it's a question of interface, we're trying to launch a product called SBK. We are launching a product called SBK that basically takes the exchange pricing on the back end and puts it into a sportsbook interface. So it's early doors in that. We launched that product about 18 months ago. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens with that. But our thinking is that if you take all the advantages of the exchange, make it look like a sportsbook, that you'll see a lot more uptake on the quote-unquote exchange. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot sort of to unpack there, I guess. But the... Um... So are you saying with, with SBK, you're saying that kind of comes first and you're more focused on feeding into the exchange because traditionally I think it's gone the other way, which I've found and I think probably my audience too will find very frustrating that kind of like Betfair sort of almost the exchange is a loss leader in a way to then get people onto the sports book and you know casino products and stuff like that too, which is obviously what sharp bettors are not really interested in, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I've been a long time observer of Betfair and, you know, now the parent company is called Flutter. You know, they've done many things well, but one of the things I think that, that they're weak on is what they stand for as a company. And I think, you know, they've kind of morphed from, you know, that when Betfair was founded 20 years ago, I would say it was kind of a forward thinking, industry shaking kind of company. And now it's sort of backed into a very staid, traditional you know, pan gambling company. And I think that's part of the reason that the exchange has taken a backseat because an exchange doesn't really fit, the idea of an exchange doesn't really fit with a sort of a sort of a broad, uh, broad-based multi-channel gambling company. Yeah, do I, I agree yeah. with that. Do you, but do you also think that part of it, sorry to interrupt, do you, do you think that part of it is kind of like the um old school industry kind of like view on things. I know that like I, I would expect that you probably experience a lot of problems with advertising, right? So like f- from what I've seen with the exchanges, like the, you know, the sports channels, they're not interested in pushing exchanges. It's a low margin product. It's not what lines their pockets versus like a bigger company like Bet365, which might have more very high affiliate commission and that kind of stuff. So is, is that not actually changed the landscape a little bit as, as well, the way that's gone? I think it's short-termism versus long-termism. You know, our mm-hmm. hypothesis is that at some point, some technology company will come along and own sports betting. That's what, that's that's what I think will happen. I'm trying for it to be markets, but it might not be markets. It might be another company. I think if you don't believe that's the case, and you will always, you know, there's like a hegemony of like six bookmakers in the UK. If you always believe it's plus or minus going to be like that, mm-hmm. you, you kind of do want a high margin product. If you're thinking about the market in short term, in a short-term way. Um, now, I believe that, and you know, I'm not a crazy genius for saying this. That technology is up in like, all industries. You know, sports betting is no different. And, you know, just from like renting movies to driving your car, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like every industry is going through crazy change. Like, I don't think that the traditional model of sports betting is tenable for that much longer. So, I think it's a mistake to put your eggs in the sports book basket. But if you're a publicly traded company, you need the share price to go up. You want you you know you want to make money now. Like the formula exists to drive high margin product with you know high advertising, high bonusy kind of experience. Like everybody knows that model works. That model's worked for the last 20, 30 years. So I don't think you have to be an insider to see why a public chief executive would make that call of, of you know the exchange versus the sportsbook. Now, from my perspective, that's a that's a mistake in the long term because I think technology at some point will catch up with the sports betting industry. I don't think it has yet, and then the, I think these guys are going to get caught flat-footed and, and be the Nokia of uh, you know the Nokia of the sports industry. Yeah, well, it happens in every industry eventually. I think, like, like you say, um, and it's kind of interesting because you touched on the football index stuff earlier on, but that there's certainly people out there looking for alternative ways to do things, and I think that. You know, generally speaking, a lot of people are kind of a bit bored of the traditional sports book um, yeah. high over round. I mean, I, I totally appreciate the, the boredom of, of, you know, like with crypto trading and stock trading. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a new world out there. And, and I can kind of see why, why sports betting um, might seem a little bit old fashioned. But I think it's such a it's such part of the culture of betting on sport that, you know, I think it's always going to be. Uh, I think it's always going to be that. Yeah, certainly. Okay, and um, one thing that I know that the followers of my my niche, if you like, in particular, uh, and myself are interested in, is the commission and charges. So, um, obviously, you've got your your standard commission, but then you've got the pro tiers or one percent, three percent select tier. And from from my perspective, as a, a short term trader in in markets sort of like live shows, horse racing, it makes it. Uh, a, a no-go for me so um is there anything you want to kind of adapt on or, or share with people re- reference that because from an alternative point of view i don't think everybody sees it from from your perspective i think liquidity is a large part of the issue isn't it yeah so you know for full disclosure we operate our own market maker that trades on this markets you know like we don't hide that at all our market maker is called hansen we're the biggest trader on smart markets by far now, the reason why we got into the Hanson business was because the big market makers at the time didn't want to deal with the small exchange, which is fair enough. So we had to kind of solve the chicken and egg problem by by playing one of the roles ourselves. And then we learned that uh, 
two things. One, we can make money doing this, which is great for a business. You have to make money. And two, that because we were sort of on the inside track, we could provide better liquidity than the traditional market makers. So if you sort of, if you, if you look at our situation, you, it's very easy to say, yeah, we have a conflict of interest and, and, you know, under a certain lens we do. But I would say, you know, there's a real advantage to that idea of vertical integration. You know, the, the company that the king of that is is Apple, you know, that you know, they basically do everything in their, their ecosystem. And I think by us being able to operate the exchange and by us being able to operate what we think is the world's largest sports market maker already, that it gives us huge advantage to pricing stuff that other people wouldn't touch with the large bowl. So what people don't see a lot of times is that we will market make a wide range of sports that are unprofitable. You know, like the more esoteric sports are can be very tricky. You know, cricket, for example, rugby, for example. Um, but because we, you know, we're trying to vertically integrate a sports betting technology company that, uh, you know, because we do the whole stack, we are able to take a more holistic view of the market, and that gives us an advantage. Now, going on to the commission. There is not one size fits all commission. I wish it were very simple. It's something that we agonize over a lot. I know a lot of people aren't happy with the decision to do, have our pro tier and select tier. And if you're on the other side of that decision, I can understand why that's very frustrating. But what we are trying to do, and, and I'm completely happy to receive criticism for our decision, but what we're trying to do is find that right balance so that we're able to take sports betting to the greater good. Right. So a lot of the people, generally speaking, there are two types of, of winners, if you like, in the in sports betting. There are the people that model the sport. They know the team very well. They may use maths. They may not use maths. Um, but people that really, really, really understand the sport. And then there are people that are taking advantage of the rules. Like they know when the market maker is going to make a mistake here. They know when uh, the way we manage the market here, there's a there's a corner case where you can where you can monetize this. They know that, you know, under this circumstance, there's going to be a mispricing. And so most of the people that are making consistent profit, not all, most have found bugs in the system, shall we say. And it's completely fair play for people to find bugs. It's completely fair play for people to monetize those bugs. But you're a company that's trying to deliver, you know, to, to revolutionize the margin in sports betting and bring it to a wide audience. We don't, you know, you want to sort of put some of the brakes on some of that activity. And that's what ProTier and SelectTier are designed to do, to sort of find that right balance between somebody monetizing what I would call bugs in the system mm. uh, while letting them continue to trade in. So it's more of a bigger picture company thing, which which I expected it to be. Um, the, I think just the, I think the frustration on a user level comes from feeling like the the rules of the marketplace have changed or restricted, um, and that's kind of an industry problem anyway. So, you know, you start to win with a bookmaker, and they restrict your bets, and and obviously that's not advertised everywhere very much. And so when you find yourself in that position, having done a lot of hard work, you think, oh. You know, someone's effectively ended the game, or you, you've got to adapt to, to go forward. But they've made life very hard for you in doing that. So I think um, yeah. I can see both sides of that. It's it's just a little bit frustrating. Now I think some people watching this would probably say, "Oh, but you you know those people will be taking money off of others uh, on the exchange, um, and so it shouldn't really be an issue." But you've already said about the 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 fact that you make the marketplace and the liquidity. So again, it comes back to the overall use, and I think if the market, the whole market was a lot bigger, then a lot of these problems wouldn't exist as much. Is that, do you think that's fair to say? So, uh, just to, so, so the reason we don't have, you know, even if we weren't involved in the market making, I still think there would be a role for pro tier and select here, or at least some version of it, because let's say, let's say you had a market making firm, right? And you employed 50 people and you traded on our platform and you made, 1% margin overall. And there was these people that kept hammering you on cricket, you know, over and over and over again. You know, they had a they had a they had a data feed to know when uh, there was a wicket before, you know, our data feed, right? So you're getting hammered every time. So, you can do a few things. One, you can not trade cricket. Two, you could go super wide in cricket. Three, you could be super thin when it's in play. 
all those things are going to be to the detriment of the normal cricket better. Mm. Right? So these things aren't designed to protect us because we're the market maker. They're designed to protect market makers because, you know, in a, so to get to Protier, you have to bet quite a lot. To get to the selector, you have to bet quite a lot. Um, you know, we can argue about maybe it's only it's only twenty five k a year, I think, isn't it? Which I mean, yeah. to, to me personally, that that makes it quite low, but not to everybody. I appreciate. Sure. I think it's twenty five thousand. Yeah. So I mean, very very few recreational punters, I think, are going to get to twenty five percent, twenty five thousand positive PNL. But anyway, we mm. it's an attempt, and I'm not saying it's perfect, and I'm not saying we won't change it, but it's an attempt to try to strike the balance between people that have systemic advantages and protect people who are providing liquidity. Now, one of the one of the properties that is very important to remember in sports betting is that it's a zero-sum game. So for every $25,000 or 25,000 pounds that a punter makes, mm -hmm. somebody has to lose those 25,000 pounds. So it's not, I'm not trying to say that from a moral perspective or an ethical perspective. It's just a math perspective. Mm -hmm. So you need to balance the, the inflows in the business with the outflows. Business and and pro tier and select tier are, are attempts, imperfect attempts to try to find that balance. No, I think that's fair, and I and, and I guess at the end of the day, you know, it is a business. You are there to make money too, so it, it's a little bit unfair for people. So I think some people typically are guilty of seeing it from their own perspective, and they think that it's just there for them, and of course, it, it's not. Um, that that reminds me. I mean, effectively, when you talk about the bugs there, you're talking about like court siders and stuff. So when I've explained that to people in the past, and I've said like, you know, if you're hosting a tea party, the people that turn up um, and sort of like take all the food and trash it and then bugger off, like they're not any use yeah. to the overall situation. So yeah, yeah I, I, I get that. A lot of our winners, uh, you know, the people who are making consistent profit. Um, have found those issues. I mean, they're not as blatant as sports setting usually, but there'll be, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to give away people's trading strategies, but you know, they'll find, uh, you know, in this circumstance they consistently make money. In this circumstance they consistently make money. And from a, from an exchange design point of view, and you know, the exchange is not designed for those people to consistently make money in these edge cases. What, with the way we design this business and this product so that we can develop, you know, deliver low margin sports betting to the masses. That's really mm -hmm. what we're passionate about. And so you got to find a balance. The last thing I wanted to say, it is incredibly, incredibly hard to market make in sports betting. Uh, so just to put a, a scope on it, like we are quoting around 50,000 contracts 24 hours a day, right? You Like with a computer, a computer can't possibly know what's going on with you know, 1,000 sports and da 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 and all these circumstances. So we are constantly getting picked off for good reasons and bad reasons. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a very, very difficult business. And so what we've tried to do to incentivize people who are super winners, we want them to be market makers. And so we have a 20% P&L split if you're a market maker. So if you are, if you are a super trader, mm -hmm. we don't want you to sit there and just pick off us or other people under this circumstance, we want you to be part of the solution and come and market make with us and provide liquidity. Of course, and from a user perspective, that's the easiest thing to do. That's probably the most profitable, the lowest risk for the highest return. So I can I can see why people do that too. Um, obviously, everyone's got different agendas in, in the equation. Yeah. Um, so while we're on that, um, the, is, is there any kind of plans in the future for markets to add API tools or have it more so like lower level traders can get involved in in so we've always wanted to do that but we've always been you know we're 110 people right now so we have to be very careful about the stuff that we work on you know we do have around 50 api, API clients um i would say sort of five are, are institutional and, and around 45 are sort of small institutional um but we require them to to do their own tools um you know, at some point, I think it would be great to integrate with Geek's Toy or Bet Angel or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things that when you're trying to, you know, if you think about the, the business pieces that we want to bring low margin sports betting to as many people as possible, mm -hmm. the API tools just never jumps to the top of your yes. list. No, of course. Yeah. So the thing that's the top of our list right now is, is SBK, which is basically bringing the exchange pricing and trying to compete with the Ladbrokes, the Bet365, mm -hmm. the Betfair Sportsbook. 
Um, that's what we are, are are mainly focused on right now, and we're super excited about that. So if you go into Odds Checker, mm -hmm. at least in the UK, our prices kick the shit out of pretty much every other bookie. No, and I expect they would. And, and one of the frustrations on Odds Checker is the fact that, I mean, part of the issue, I think, is also uh, fractional odds, decimal odds. If you've got fractional odds set an Odds Checker, and you, and you kind of look at maybe SBK, I haven't really looked at SBK on there, um, or, or any of the exchanges in comparison to the bookies, they are better prices a lot of the time. They're kind of neglected down at the end of a little thin grey line to, to detach them. But what, what comparing them is almost impossible because what is sort of like 53 to, to 21 in comparison to to sort of like 6 to 4 or something like that, it's, it's very confusing. Yeah. Fractions still do my head in. So, you know, like I've been in this business for 13 years. Don't, don't ask me to do fractional odds. I, I, I about can handle two to one, and that's not it. Um, so I always convert odds checker to decimal. Well, so do I, but I, I don't know that the masses do that, do they? Uh, yeah, but maybe maybe the masses, I mean, some masses do. And so, you know, like the, the market's quite big, right? Sports betting is a two billion pound industry in the UK alone. Like that's not a small industry for, for the island that you guys that you guys live on so it's 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 a pretty it's a pretty big industry and, and my guess is around a third of the market is price sensitive mm. and you know if you are price sensitive and you do want to shop you're probably not using fractions now we offer fractions um i think i think what we need to do is to to try to build on our reputation of having the best price you know mm. it's kind of like like a lot of people think that amazon has the best price they don't uh, all the time, but they've sort of got they've sort of built that reputation as the go-to place that people trust them enough that they won't do comparison shopping anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to get to that point. So, like, if you're a fractional better and you don't want to mess with comparing fifty-three to twenty-one or whatever, then then you would trust us. But I think we have to start with people that do price comparison um, in decimal so that they see what the difference. Is. Yeah, sure. No, okay. And then the last thing I want to pick your brains before before we go is your view um, and perspective on affordability because i think at the moment this is frustrating the hell out of so many people yeah. um how did you see it do you think yeah. they're getting it right so i will say you know as a punter uh, like as a as a customer i i'm feeling the brunt of this too you know i i use revolut and revolut really gave me the hardest time to get my uh account um re i don't know what you uh, authenticated, I guess. I think it's kind of an industry-wide thing. Um, if you want to be angry at somebody, you can be angry at the American government. A lot of this stuff started after September 11th, you know, when when uh, you know America was caught by surprise with all the terrorism financing. America passed a ton of nasty laws to kind of go after the banking system, and the rest of the world to sort of be compliant um, with the American banking system created uh, similar laws. And I think if you're if you're sitting in London or wherever and you're trying to develop regulation to do this stuff and you don't know anything about sports betting, sports betting from the outside looks like a huge vector for money laundering and terrorism and all that kind of stuff. And I'll get to affordability in a second because that's kind of a sec second branch of the tree. But from an AML perspective, I know that there's credible pressure from governments to go after money laundering, um, and the government does frankly, does not have enough resource to police this stuff. So mm -hmm. they are pushing the burden and the responsibility to the operator. So the operator is on the hook if there were money laundering to occur and the operator missed it, the operator is liable for that. Mm -hmm. So there's an incredible amount of responsibility that, frankly, I think belongs to the police and it belongs to financial uh, the financial authorities. But the governments aren't resourcing this properly, and they're putting the burden on on the uh, operator. In terms of the affordability, and that's not just sports betting, by the way. That's sort of you know, as I said, that's sort of banking. And you know, if you if you try to open an account at Lloyd's these days, it's probably much harder to open an account at Lloyd's than it was two years. Sure, and well, I think the problem, with, from my perspective, or the, the audience with with sports betting is. Um... A lot of the uh, the other firms might not be using them in the same way that an exchange is, so it might not be applicable to you so much. But they're kind of like you know going down the bank statements, seeing that you're consistently withdrawing from Betfair or maybe even Smarkets, and then going, well, we don't want you using that brooks, you know, or, or whatever other firm it is. 
Um, and people suspect that they're using it for the purposes of sifting out sharp people and, and just saying no. So that is possible. But I would say that, like, I would try, you know, like, I'm not a punter that's had my account closed by a high street bookie. So, you know, I don't have the experience. But I would say that from the operator's perspective, I know that they're under incredible pressure from the UKGC, which is the UK Gambling Commission. They're under incredible pressure from regulators all over the map to, to basically clamp down on this stuff. And if you look at the sort of the, the industry news, there, is, there have been so many fines in the last 12 months. You know, the, I don't know what the actual number is, but the, the amount of fines over the last 12 months probably equals the amount of fines or is greater than the amount of fines over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So the fines by regulators have, has gone up an incredible amount. The other thing that the UKGC is really pushing is sort of affordability checks. You know, I think the, the, the pandemic, of course, took a large hit and, you know, the, the morale of people and, and the UKGC, rightly so, you know, wants to take kind of a harder line on, you know, people turning to gambling to try to alleviate their, their malaise. And so the, the Gambling Commission is, is really pushing operators to make sure that people have the money. Now, I think that if you imagine yourself, you work for a gambling company and your job is to decide if you allow this customer to bet or not, the, you know, and you're not the boss, it's very easy, you know, it's much easier to say no than it is to say yes, right? Mm -hmm. Because you probably will not get in trouble for saying no. But if you say yes to keep this account going and there's an issue down the line, mm -hmm. it's possible that it can come back and, you know, whether it was stolen money or whether it was Mm -hmm. money laundering or the person you know had a gambling addiction and you didn't catch it like the incentive is there here for the operator to just be like we don't want we don't want to have to deal with it mm -hmm. so i imagine in a lot of the complicated cases and indeed we see it ourselves where you know you just a lot of money flowing through the account and a lot of you know there's not a lot of backup where they where the money's from you know it's so much easier to say let's just close it move on with their lives mm. than, than keeping it open and, and taking the risk. So it is possible that that uh, operators are doing stuff, you know, sort of underhandedly to close accounts that they don't want. But I would say to, to your listeners out there that the regulators are really, really coming up with this stuff. And operators are under tremendous pressure to uh, up the checks. Sure, that's fair enough, and, and uh, I just thought of one of my own personal experiences with they're, they're not they're not too uh, willing to communicate a lot of the time. These regulating type, well, as far as I'm aware, you know anyway. That is, you know why that is? No, and I take a huge issue with this, but it is against the law to tip off a client. So if you ex if you suspect a uh, funny business, you are literally not allowed to do anything to let that person know that you. And I can see why they'd add that. But so from my personal perspective, I had a, a bank account frozen for, for several months and they, and they, you know, it was like talking to a wall. I was, they were like, where's the money come from? And I'm like, well, you know, sports betting exchanges, blah, blah, blah. I can prove it. I can show you. And they just, and then they were like, where's the money come from? And I'm like, I just told you like, and the, but people don't win a bet. And I'm like, well, a very small percentage of people do like, but that was so painful, I can tell you. And, and like having the account frozen and not be, I mean, it didn't really affect me because I had other accounts and, and money elsewhere. But I can and I can kind of imagine trying to see it through an operator's eyes. It might be like talking to a wall when dealing with some of these issues. But well, if you if you have to deal with fifty of these things a day, mm. you know, and it, you know, like I said, it's easier to say no, and it's and in general, you want to say the least amount of possible, and you know, this might be a bad sort of parallel, but like if you need to dismiss somebody from an organization or you're about to, you know, you're a defendant in a, uh, a criminal case, generally speaking, you want to say as little as possible, right? Because you mm -hmm. don't want to say something that that person can come back. So my guess is, not my guess, my, my, my suggestion is that, you know, we don't want our, our guys coming to customers and say, Tipping them off because it's against the law to tip people mm -hmm. off. So mm -hmm. we literally, literally a limit to the stuff that we can say legally, and mm -hmm. so it's just easier to kind of keep it uh, pared down.
very, very brief. It's, it's something that we're trying to make as smooth as possible. We're trying to do our part by like threading the needle of doing right by customers and following the law, but there's a giant gray area. Um, personally, I think governments, like I said, personally, I think governments are pushing too much responsibility on mm -hmm. operators. Yeah. I don't think a private enterprise should be responsible for policing money laundering. I think that's something that the police should do. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that should be funded for the police to do. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's our responsibility. Now the law isn't written that way. It is our responsibility yeah. to police money laundering, unfortunately. So um, you know, if while doing that, we aren't really allowed to talk to you about it. No, of course I get that, and, and nobody wants money laundering, and nobody wants problem gamblers. No, like I don't want that either. Um, yeah. So it's incredibly frustrating. I think it's just on on the alternate side, it's frustrating to find that I might open my account with a well known sports book um, that's kind of like top league, and they manage to identify me as a winner and close me in like less than a day. But you know, when it comes to affordability, you're sat there two weeks later waiting to you know the tenth time you've put your pass. Yeah, well. Different, different, different priorities too. But uh, yeah, there's, but there's also there's also different legal risk, right? There's no legal risk for them closing you as a winner, but there is legal risk for them. Like, mm. let's say you were dirty money, there is legal risk. For them. No, I get that. I appreciate that, and I think it's good for people to hear. Having seen this, too. you know, you know, in all honesty, I don't know what the right form would be, but I would encourage you and people who don't like this stuff to talk to the gambling commission because mm. the gambling commission is behind a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And I think it would be good for them to hear from, from professional betters about what it's like to be on that list. I'm not sure they listen to us so much either, but hey. No, uh, well, <laughs> you would be surprised. That, you know, I think that, you know, they're trying to do the right thing, mm. you know. But in general, with, you know, like when you're trying to do the right thing, it can be very easy to overcorrect, you know, to yeah. try to do too much. And I think it's a new world and everybody's trying to find the, the right balance and, and, you know, I don't think that they've nailed it yet, but I think that their their hearts are great. Of course. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for your time, Jason. I fully appreciate that, and uh, I'm sure other people will too. Thanks for coming on. I wish you uh, every success in the future. Well, cool. thanks for having me. Cheers. <laughs>